Invite anyone who is young in body or in spirit to come up to the front and listen to a story. Hi. All right, so this morning, um, the theme of February is love. So this morning, we're going to be talking about animals who have best friends. So when, when an animal has a best friend, do you think it's usually a best friend that's the same kind of animal? No? Well, sometimes it is. But in, in a book, if we're bothering to write a book about it, I bet they're not going to be the same kind of animal. So I'm going to tell you the story. This is the first story in this book of two animals named Milo and Bone Digger 
who are best friends. I'm going to hold this down so you guys can see a little better. So lions are known as the king of the jungle. But sometimes Bone Digger gets startled when Milo barks. Who would have thought that a pet dog could hold his own against a fearless wildcat? Their story might have been much different if they hadn't met each other when they were both so little. Bone Digger was born with a disease which made it hard for him to walk, and so the zookeepers decided that they should keep the little lion cub separate from the other animals in the enclosure. And they took him home for special care. And that is where Bone Digger met Milo and three other dachshund pups that he now calls his best friends. So you can see them sitting together. Because he was young and had trouble walking, the dogs weren't scared of Bone Digger at all. In fact, Milo and the other puppies tried to protect the lion cub even as he grew. It didn't take long before Milo and Bone Digger became best buds. They wrestled together and fought over toys just like siblings do. Can you imagine fighting with a lion over a toy? Who would win? But as far as anyone can tell, Milo thinks Bone Digger is a really big dog. Or maybe Milo considers himself a really tiny lion. The two unlikely buddies share meals of raw meat, and they eat side by side without fighting at all. And those are some pretty big teeth not to be scared of. Milo sometimes tries to copy the puffing or the loud roars of his lion friend. While Bone Digger's roar can be heard from almost a mile away, it's unlikely that the mini sausage dog will ever be able to make the noise that loud, even if it's a bark or a roar. Although being loud might not be Milo's goal, maybe he's just trying to learn the language of his lion friend. After all, it would be hard to speak a different language from your best friend. Bone Digger is healthy now, and he and his canine pals live happily together at the zoo. It might be unusual to see dogs at a zoo, but there is no way the zookeeper can break up these friends. They are inseparable. They sleep together every night, and the dachshunds like lying on top of Bone Digger, like he's a giant lion-shaped pillow. Whenever the dogs do separate from their lion friend, they're sure to check in with him immediately when he returns. It's like Bone Digger is keeping count and making sure everyone is safe. So while Milo was the first to protect Bone Jigger, now the lion is watching over his doggy pals. That is what friends are for. So would you have guessed right away that a lion could be friends with a tiny little wiener dog? Yeah. They can. They can be friends. Lion and tiny little wiener dog, they are best friends. No, the lion shares his food with a tiny little wiener dog. Isn't that great? So that just goes to show you don't have to be just like your best friends. Your best friends can be different everything. Anyhow, that is the story we have today. Thank you so much for sharing it with me. I don't condemn my 
but don't converge. This is the calling, have you heard? Bring all the lovers in the fall. Cause no one's gonna lose their soul. Come on. Love is my religion. Love is my religion. Love is my religion. Love is my religion. Hey, you can take it or leave it. And you don't have to believe it. I don't want to fight. Hey, let's go fly a kite. There's nothing we can cure And I'll keep you in my arms for sure So don't let nobody stop us Free spirits have to soar With you I share my gift That gift we know Oh, here we go Love is my religion Love is my religion Love is my religion Love is my religion I don't condemn, I don't convert This is the calling you have heard Bring all the lovers to the fold Cause no one's gonna lose their soul Come on Love is my religion Love is my religion Love is my religion You can take it or leave it For a reading this morning, I have um, a reading from Ginger Luke, who is a pastor out of sorry, um, Bethsaida, Maryland, so actually she's pretty close to us. Um, she wrote something called Love is the Ethical Basis. She says, I grew up close to the land in Sand Hills of Nebraska. My father would take me for walks across the prairies and call out the names of the grasses like blue grandma and sand blue stem. He would lean down, pick a blade, and chew on it. We spent hours working in the family garden and planting and harvesting peas, radishes, strawberries, green beans. I remember picking potato bugs off the potato plants. I remember hiking through wild roses under the pines and oaks as we walked down to a little lake below our house. The little lake was fed by the Minichaduza Creek, which flowed into the Niobrara River. We canoed on the Niobrara, where it flowed into the Missouri. I always knew I was part of that natural world. The idea that human beings and nature were two separate things would have perplexed me. The world was filled with mystery, but it was a mystery of which I was a part. You couldn't walk out of it because you were in it, and it was in you. There was a great power for creation and destruction in the world I grew up in, but the power was not conscious through planning and manipulation. It was a power that invited exploration and discovery. It incited awe and incited caution. And I was part of it because I was a human being, and everyone else was too. In that amazing sense of place, I experienced love. It was the ethical basis for the life of the people in my family. I was unconditionally loved. You know our human hardwired trait of 
always reaching out to help someone if they're falling or tripping beside us, or say if they're in a car that's stopping, reach out. Well, that's the world I grew up in. If something was heavy, people helped you carry it. We were part of the natural world, and we respected the world, and we valued each other. And if that weren't so, as I looked out at the world, I knew it was because people were oblivious to their harmfulness or because they were hurt or afraid. The love I experienced was created, given, and received by people. It shaped how I cared about people, helped them learn to learn more about those I'd never known, and thought of those who came before me and would come after me. We were creating the best world we could, and our actions were motivated by our image of the world that might be. I helped establish a UU campus ministry at the University of Nebraska. The college students were amazingly motivated as they planned their entire program. And shortly after we began, a conservative Lutheran graduate student joined our group. I thought he was there to convert us. But as he kept coming, it seemed he was trying to figure us out. One day he said to me, I think I figured it out. You don't control your actions because God told you to. You do it because that's what you think is right. You got it, I said. The reason I don't kill is not because God told me not to kill. It's because I don't want to live in a world where people kill each other. I refrain from stealing not because God told me not to steal, but because I don't want to live in a world where people steal. I reject hate not because God told me not to hate, but because I don't want to live in a world filled with hatred. I love and I care for people because that's the kind of world that I want for myself and for those who come after me. When the natural world is cruel or vicious, it is love, human love, that holds and comforts me and gives me solid ground on which to stand. I've never thought what the insurance company calls acts of God were ever really acts of God. Who wants a God that causes or allows tornadoes or floods or other natural disasters? When human cruelty or violence causes pain or death, I look to human love, which I am not uncomfortable calling divine love, for comfort. I often find this love in my Unitarian Universalist community. The love within this community directs me not to just sit and take it, but to do all I can to stop the cruelty and violence. So experiencing catastrophe causes me to act as well as to grieve. When I look at a sleeping baby or the wrinkled arthritic hands of my mother, when I listen to Kiri Tikanawa singing the aria from Bacanias Brasileiras number five, when my 11-year-old grandson gives me a hug and says, Love you, Grammy. I'm stopped in my tracks by the wonder of life. The miracle, the science of cells and bodies, the unlikelihood that all of this could come together and create life itself. And I'm thankful. The medieval mystic Meister Eckhart was right. If the only prayer you ever say in your life is thank you, it will be enough. Being a humanist calls me to be my better self. It holds me in blessed community during the good times and the hard times and allows me to continually search for more meaning and understanding in the world of science and art. And my humanism is shaped by love. Participating in a religious community makes my humanism whole because I don't exist in the world as a lone entity. I am part of that whole. I knew this even as a child. Being a humanist is a religious act for me. May it always be so. Standing on the crossroads, trying to read the signs, to tell me which way I should go to find the answer, and all the time I know. Plant your love and let it grow. Let it grow, let it grow. 
let it blossom, let it flow. In the sun, the rain, the snow. Love is lovely. Let it grow. Looking for a reason to check out on my mind. Trying hard to find a friend that I can count on. There's nothing left to show. Plant my love and let it grow. Let it grow, let it grow. Let it blossom, let it flow. In the sun, the rain, the snow. Love is lovely. Let it grow. Time is getting shorter. There's much for you to do. Only ask and you will get what you are needing. The rest is up to you. Plant your love and let it grow. Let it grow. Let it grow. Let it blossom. Let it flow. In the sun, the rain, the snow. Love is love. Let it grow. Chimps on a plane. Okay, so I looked and I looked, and I couldn't find that article that had the writer imagining the plane full of chimpanzees. But I'm going to invite you now to all close your eyes and imagine being on a plane full of chimpanzees. You, you can open your eyes pretty quickly because it's not pretty. <laughs> In fact, you know, name just about any animal you choose. And then imagine packing all those animals into a small box for 12 hours, unrestrained, and let's just say that the seat box and trays would not remain in their upright and locked position. Yeah. So while I was looking for that article, I came across a different article, um, one that was published in Esquire magazine in 2009. Rich Shapiro, writing for Esquire, tells the story of St. James Davis, and LaDonna Davis. In 1967, St. James Davis flew home to Los Angeles from a trip to Africa with a tiny baby chimpanzee named Mo sitting on his lap. And now you see why Google gave me this story when I searched for chimpanzee in plain. So the story of bringing home Mo, which is somewhat lost to history, is that Mo's mother was killed by bush hunters and St. James couldn't bear to let the little one die, so he wandered through the jungle until he met some missionaries who arranged to get him home. He swears by this story, although it's, um, it was at the time a common practice for exotics trades people to kill mothers that had babies so that they could then sell the baby. Um, but you know, he swears that it was just they were poaching for meat. Anyhow, um, the missionaries arranged to get him home, and apparently it was the 1960s, so nobody blinked an eye about carrying a chimpanzee on your lap like a toddler. And when St. James came home, he married his high school sweetheart, LaDonna, and they planned to start a family. But LaDonna was diagnosed with cancer and had to have a hysterectomy. So the couple decided that they would raise Mo as their son. And I know what you're probably thinking. Chimpanzees are really dangerous. They're cute when they're little, and then they go through their adolescence, and then they become crazy. They're not baboon crazy, but they're still pretty crazy. 
And well, when Mo was young, he was on, you know, Sesame Street in Reading Rainbow. Like he actually was on TV. And they dressed him in little um, plastic diaper pants and jeans and button down shirts every day. And he had his own room upstairs with toys. Well, St. James did a bunch of research and they discovered that you, you can't have a teenage, uh, a teenager monkey, uh, any kind of great ape in your house because it's a bad idea. So they built him a cage outdoors. They would still interact with him every day, but he mostly lived in his cage. And um, Shapiro quotes St. James as saying, I used to tell people, my son is 30 years old and still wants to live at home. So Mo lived peacefully with the Davises until 1999. So, I mean, when you think about it, he came home in 1967, 1999. That's a really long time for a chimpanzee to be living peacefully in a suburb of Los Angeles. But um, in 1999, a visitor stuck her hand into Mo's cage after being warned, don't stick your hand into the cage with a chimpanzee. And she got bit. So... Um, Mo was removed by animal control, and he was taken to a wildlife center. And the Davises were devastated because um, Mo had lived with them his whole life. This was his this was his second violent incident. One time he escaped and he bit somebody when they were trying to put him back in. But you know that was after a long police chase with sirens and cars and scariness. The Davises were only allowed to visit him for 15 minutes at a time once a week, and every time they visited him, he would give the sign for hug, and he would give the sign for ride in the car, because he wanted to go home. Well, the couple paid to have his cage upgraded, and they installed a TV, because Mo likes his TV. And after a couple of years and a lot of legal wrangling, Mo was transferred to a new sanctuary, where the Davises could come and visit their boy for as long as they wanted. So every week, they'd drive two and a half hours out to this other sanctuary, and they'd spend the day. They'd give him, like, a raspberry cake, because that was he loved peanut butter and jelly. They'd make him peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um, and they'd bring toys. And they didn't just bring toys for him. They brought toys for all the, all the uh, primates at this center. <sighs> well, one day, tragedy struck. And it's not what you're thinking. Mo didn't do anything bad, but a careless staff member left two out of three doors unlocked in another cage on the, on the primate wing, and two primates got out and really severely injured St. James. Like, first they went after his wife, and they thought, oh, they just want the cake, so they, like, threw this giant sheet cake at them, but no, they wanted to savage... They wanted to savage the people. They don't know if, if they were trying to, like, steal resources. They don't know. But you know what? He lost a whole bunch. Like, he lost uh, limbs. He lost an eye. And as soon as he could make it back to the facility, he started visiting his son again every single week in the wheelchair because that's how he thought of him. He didn't think of him as this this you know, wild beast. He thought of him as his boy. So you can choose to see this story as a cautionary tale. And it is. Don't bring home exotic animals and keep them as pets. That's a bad idea. And, you know, the exotic animal trade is really deeply flawed. But when I look at this story, I see a story of love. This couple loved this wild animal like he was their own. And, you know, I don't believe humans are alone in their capacity to love. It may be anthropomorphizing, but I believe that animals love and value the connections that they have with their families and with their human families. I believe that, like humans, animals can form cross-species bonds. You know, stories of animal odd couples, like the one I read this morning, they're all over children's literature section. But these stories are notable because they are an exception, and they're not the rule. Humans forming cross-species bonds is nothing out of the ordinary, though. Even if you don't personally have a pet, I will bet that every single one of you knows somebody who does, possibly more than one, and possibly to an extent that you think, why? 
So articles abound with information about the ways that having a pet can benefit people. Sources like WebMD, the CDC, NPR, various medical journals, all of them say that pets can help lower blood pressure, they can lower your triglyceride levels, they can alleviate feelings of loneliness or anxiety. I mean, just look at all the people who are flying with their companion animals for, for airplanes, you know. You can search monkeys on a plane and someone will have brought a monkey as a therapy animal in the seat next to them for free. But um, pets also, not just on planes, but everywhere, pets increase opportunities for exercise and for socialization. I mean, I know that the only reason any of my no neighbors know who I am is because I'm out there every day walking my dog. Otherwise, I would just be hiding in my house. Like, even the male person would never see me. I would wait until, like, is the male there? Okay. Is the mailman driven away? Okay. But, you know, everyone knows me. I'm the lady who has the Rottweiler. And um, there are also various studies that say that um, children who are raised in households with pets have a decreased incidence of allergies and other autoimmune disorders. Um, so why is it that humans are so likely to have pets? What is it about us? Well, I think that has to do with the human socialization window. So I'm going to talk a little bit about socialization windows first. You've heard of that, right? The, let's say you have a dog, and when you bring home your new puppy, they say, expose it to lots of different things. So you want to expose it to different environments. You want to expose it to different animals. You want to expose it to different sounds, like the vacuum cleaner. Because otherwise, I know I have a dog who's not exposed to vacuum cleaners. And she's like, oh, it's going to eat me. So everything it needs to accept as an adult in order to be healthy and well-adjusted, it needs to be exposed to in this little short window. So in wolves, the socialization period begins at two weeks, which is before all of the pup's senses have actually even developed. So they start exploring with scent, which is the only sense they have to start. And then suddenly, they can hear, oh my gosh, everything is scary, I can hear! And then, oh, okay, everything's fine. It's, this is okay. It's, you're just supposed to be able to hear. That's normal. All right. And then they're accustomed to scent and to sound. And then, ah, I can see. What the heck is going on? What is this? Oh, everything is fine. It's okay. Well, you know, in dogs, the socialization period is not at two weeks. It doesn't start until four weeks. So all their senses are already online. So, you know, you take a four-week-old puppy, you show it a horse, and it's like, oh, horses, those are great. And it's fine with horses for the rest of its life. Because dogs don't have the same series of shocks that wolves do. They have that same imprinting period where you have to expose them to different things, but it happens at a different time so that dogs mostly don't have a formative experience of fear. Most puppies that are raised in loving homes, they have a formative experience that's just love. So have you ever heard of the domesticated fox experiment? About 60 years ago, up in Siberia, a Russian researcher named Dmitry Belyev started a breeding program. He was trying to replicate 10,000 years of selective breeding that created dogs out of wolves in a single human lifetime using foxes. He was like, oh, they're both canids, it should work. So he started by breeding only the tamest, friendliest foxes together. He, he would go out to different places where they were capturing wild foxes for fur. And if, if a fox actually was um, able to not die with, of a heart attack from being caught, that already, that would be one step closer to being tame because that does happen, like foxes that get caught by humans in the wild. So don't go out and try and catch a fox. It's a bad idea. Um, so he would breed just the tamest, the friendliest foxes together. And he started doing that. And after about 10 generations, he noticed that most of the foxes would be able to accept another human being, like a human being in the room, without like cowering in the back of their cage like they were about to die. And then he started to notice that these friendlier foxes, like further and further into the breeding process, the friendlier foxes would have 
traits that aren't seen in the wild. They would have white patches and like wild foxes don't have these like white patches on their chest, like a dog, like you, you can see, or some of them are blotched. They look like collies. And they have curly tails, some of them, which, you know, you've seen foxes. They have a big, bushy, regular tail. Some tame foxes, they have curly tails. They also retain those floppy puppy ears for a much longer time. They do eventually stand up, but their floppy puppy ears are kept longer. This is all a part of what's called neoteny. Also, it's called pedomorphism. And it's what happens when a characteristic that's usually associated with juveniles is retained by adults. So researchers believe, believe that neoteny is what's responsible for these foxes' new physical traits, and that these physical traits are linked to the behavioral traits. And you're looking confused, like, why would that be? Well, um, We'll get into that in a minute, actually. I want to read this next little piece, because this is funny. So Believ succeeded to a point. He was able to breed foxes that love people and beg for attention. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, the research dollars for the experiment ran out, so they had to sell some of their foxes. And there's a conservation group in San Diego who has five of them. There's like one person in the entire country who lives in Florida that you can ex import these foxes through. Um, and there's a research facility in San Diego that has five of them, including one named Boris. And so they interviewed the center's, um, the guy that runs the conservation center. And he says, as soon as someone walks up to the facility, he'll run up to them just like a dog does, and he wants to be scratched. And if you don't scratch him, he'll make you scratch him. And Amy Bassett, who also runs the conservation center, she's like, Yep, and then he'll jump up onto the table, pee in my coffee cup, and wait, what? So friendly? Yes, yeah, super friendly, not so domesticated. So foxes are not the only species where neoteny may be a developmental factor. One theory about humans and cooperation runs that neoteny is part of what sets humans apart from our nearest primate relatives. A 2009 article by Charles Chua summarizes these similarities. Humans, we also have, um, sorry, just like immature chimps, humans also have small jaws, flat faces, and sparse body hair. And you know, you've all seen the baby chimp with the completely bald face. So we share something on the order of 98.8% of our DNA with chimpanzees. However, the timing at which these genes are expressed is very different. They did a study to analyze the 299 genes that, are, that have timing differences, and they're all active later in life for humans than they are for chimpanzees and macaques. So Chua suggests that the long childhood of the human species is part of what makes us successful. Having a long childhood and a long adolescence gives humans a uniquely long period of brain plasticity. And we often say, you know, children are like sponges. They'll suck up whatever you put in front of them. They're constantly learning. So to put it another way, humans have a really long socialization period a long period of time where we can accept new things and think, oh, that's not so scary, that's okay. There's actually a really interesting graphic that I found in a 2009 article by Jeffrey Milburn. At the top, it shows three different chimpanzee skulls. It shows an infant skull, and then it shows a juvenile skull, and it shows an adult skull. And at the bottom, it shows an eerily similar line drawing of a human infant skull and a human adult skull. And you know, the human adult skull has lines that really, really mimic a juvenile chimpanzee skull. So as humans, human adults, we still retain that juvenile capacity for change, the juvenile capacity to learn. But you know, as we saw with the Fox study, Lengthening childhood also potentially has the effect of increasing docility. There's a well-known hormone cascade that occurs when an animal goes from juvenile to adult. Now, in most species, this changes a relatively tractable juvenile 
and you know adorable little baby animal into a vicious wild animal that wants to eat your face off. So you know we thought human teenagers were tough to deal with. Imagine animal teenagers. It may not sound like docility is a boon to humanity, but if I put it another way, this docility has the effect of decreasing aggression and increasing the ability of diverse family groups to band together into larger societies. That means that humans are shaped and filled up by our capacity to love and our capacity to accept new people and new things and new ideas. We lavish love on everything we come in contact with. We can't say that science proves this is so, but even Darwin hypothesized that the ability to work together, the moral compass that allows us to love our neighbors, is a factor in human survival. He says, it must not be forgotten that although a high standard of morality gives but a slight or no advantage to each individual man and his children over the other men in the same tribe, an increased number of well-endowed men in the advancement of standard of morality will give an immense advantage to one tribe over another. All of that to say, where people love one another and work together, it makes us stronger. Or as the Dalai Lama would say, love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. But all of this only works when you are in relationship with your enemies. You know, Romans 12 says, never pay back evil for evil. Let your aims be such as all men count honorable. My dear friends, do not seek revenge, but leave a place for divine retribution. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. By doing this, you will heap live coals on his head. That's right, Romans 12 is advocating being aggressive in your kindness. Be the Petruchio to your enemy's Kate. Maybe you'll manage to tame that shrew. But, you know, if someone, this only works if you're in a relationship with your enemy. So if someone's trying to actively kill you, offering them a hot beverage will probably not be the answer. But let's say we are in a situation where being kind to an enemy can heap those metaphorical coals by forcing them to see you as a real human being. I'm reminded of the story of Daryl Davis, whose story is told in the documentary Accidental Courtesy, which was released at the end of 2016. Davis is a blues musician who befriends members of the KKK. Davis is black. What Davis told The Atlantic was, the most important thing I learned is that when you're actively learning about someone else, you are passively teaching them about yourself. Davis would talk to people who had no exposure to people like him, who we might say lacked socialization. And he would change their minds. Stories like that make me wonder who I might change if I tried to build a relationship. Mother Teresa once said, we can do no great things, only small things with great love. I'd like to leave you with that thought today. The great mysteries of time and awareness, uh, time and evolution have given us the gift of awareness. We've received this gift of a long childhood and a sort of permanent adolescence. We as a species have been given the ability to live in harmony, even with those outside our family group, even with those outside our own species. We have the capacity to accept those who are different from us, and we have the capacity to care not just for ourselves, but for the whole planet. So what shall we do with this great gift that we've been given? Well, I'm hoping that the answer we will give is love. Thank you.
Last days I've been searching To find out what the life is worth Through the books and Bibles of time I've been abiding with mine I don't condemn, I don't convert This is the calling you have heard Bring all the lovers to the fall Cause no one is gonna lose a soul Now Love is my religion Love is my religion Love is my religion Love is my religion I don't want to fight Hey, let's go fly a kite There is nothing we can't cure And I'll keep you in my arms For sure So don't let nobody stop us Free spirits have to soar With you I share this gift Do you believe? 